Hi everybody and welcome to another Bowtie Future video. Today I'm going to be going through the paper 1H topics that have come up from my analysis of all of the past papers from the new specification. So I've gone through all of the papers and analysed all of the content and come up with a list of the top 10 things that you need to study in order to do the best that you possibly can in paper 1H. So without further ado, let's get started. So as you can see from this diagram, all of the data is shown with the size of the boxes indicating the proportion of the questions that are dedicated to each topic. So at the top left you have ratios which is responsible for 48 of all of the marks for paper 1H. Okay? So we'll start with the top left and work our way down and towards the right. And that way you can study a little bit more efficiently to make sure that you cover everything that you need. Okay? Ideally you would cover every single topic on this list but you should focus your energies towards the top left and then work your way down. So we'll start with ratios and have a look at what those questions usually entail to make sure that you can answer them effectively in the exam. So ratios crop up in lots and lots of different questions in lots of different ways, and I've highlighted a few of them here. So you can see that sometimes it's as simple as two angles and it'll say that theta is in a ratio of two to one with alpha. So when we're doing this type of question, what we want to do is assign a variable such as x to this, and then theta, which is two to one ratio, is going to be two lots of x. So in total, that angle in that triangle will be three x, and you can start to build up from there. Sometimes they would have a probability question, and it would give you, say, 0.4 for this one, and then it said the other two are in a ratio of two to one. So the, the remainder of this is 0.6, and it's in a ratio of 2 to 1. So you would do 2x to x, and then you've got 3x is worth 0 0.6. So 3x is 0 0.6, so you can work out from there what each of these are going to be. Ratios also crop up when you're dividing an amount. So in this case, you're adding up the ratios 2 plus 3 plus 5, and you're dividing that into this to find out what one share is worth. So in this case, you would do 1,200 divided by 10, and that would give you 120 for each share. This person here has got two shares, so you multiply that by two, you multiply it by three and five, and then once you get your three answers, just add them up again and check you get back to your original 1200 like that. We're also using ratios when we're doing similar shapes. So in this case, we've got two shapes A and B, and their area is in a ratio of four to nine. So when we're looking at the length of A compared to the length of B, then we would square root this to get 2 to 3, and then if we wanted the volume of A to the volume of B, we could then cube this to get 8 to 27. So if the question is asking you how many times can A fill B, for example, if this was glasses of water or something, then you would do 27 divided by 8, and you could see how many times that would go into B. And that kind of leads into what a lot of students don't realize about ratios is that they're fractions they can be expressed as fractions. So this question here where you've got this quadratic and it's got x squared to 3x plus 5, what we can actually do with these is we can divide these things and we can put them equal to each other. So if you divide these in the same way, so the first one divided by the second one, then they will be in the same ratio. So you can start to build up a quadratic equation here. So if I cross multiply these and I get 2x squared equals 3x plus 5, and I can start to rearrange that and solve that equation because using that fact that x squared to 3x plus 5 is in a ratio of 1 to 2. And we also use this a lot in vectors as well when we're trying to prove that two lines are parallel. So if we have two lines and this one's a plus b and this is 3 halves a plus 3 halves b, then it's parallel because these are in the same ratio of, of each other. So how do we show that? Well, we can take the three halves out as a factor and then we've got this one-to-one -one relationship here. Or we can actually do a divided by three halves a and that will be equal to the ratio of b over three halves b. So when you cancel the a's and the b's, we've got one over three halves, so that's two-thirds equals two-thirds. So you can see that they're in a ratio of two-thirds to two-thirds or a one-to-one -one relationship. So Ratios crop up all the time in lots of different ways, and it's important because they're so common that you can answer questions in all of these different ways. So try to practice these from the past papers and make sure that you can identify where the ratios are being used and that you understand how they're being used in 
particularly with the division. The next topic I want to talk about is indices. So making sure that we can do the basic ones where we have a cubed times a squared and we add in the powers to get 5 from 3 plus 2. When we divide, we're going to subtract the powers of 7 minus 2. Anything to the power of 0 is 1 and anything to the power of 1 is itself. Okay, so they're the four basic rules of indices. We start to use these in combination when we do things like this. So 3x squared times 2x cubed Students often get this wrong because they'll, they'll do 3 times 2, but they'll do 3 plus 2 because they're adding 2 and 3 with the powers. But with the numbers, we must multiply those to get 6, 3 times 2. And then we have x squared times x cubed, which is x to the power of 5. We have a more complicated one where we have the numbers first, like 12 times 2 is 24. We've got a squared times a, a cubed, b times b is b squared, and c times c is c squared. And then we divide that by 6ab squared c cubed. So we can, again, do the numbers first. So 24 divided by 6, that's going to be a 4. a cubed divided by a, we can cancel that to get a squared. b squared divided by b squared, that gets 1. And c squared divided by c cubed, that's actually going to be the c squared. And we're going to have a c on the bottom like that. So our final answer will be 4 a squared over c, like that. Okay. When we have negative and fractional indices, we have to understand what the negative sign does. So when we have a negative power, we must flip it upside down, or if it's just, say, 6 to the minus 2, we do 1 over 6 squared. So the 1 over is the 6 over 1 as a fraction, we flip that upside down to give you 1 over 6, and then we've removed the minus sign to just give that as a positive 2 there. So if we want to remove this minus sign, we have to flip this whole thing upside down. So 9x squared over 27 to the 2 thirds to the power of 1 half. So that negative sign is now gone. We've flipped that upside down. What we have to do now is do every single thing to the power of a half. So 9 to the power of a half, x squared to the power of a half, and we have 27 to the 2 thirds to the power of a half. So this gives us a chance to talk about all of these different um, ways of using powers with the fraction. So 9 to the power of a half is the square root of 9. So when we have a fractional power, the denominator is the number that goes in front of the root. So the 2 becomes the 2 in front of the square root, which is just the square root sign. The square root of 9 is going to be 3. And then x squared to the power of a half, when we have a power to a power, we multiply the powers to give us x to the power of 1, which is, as the above one says, x to the power of 1 is just x. We're going to divide that by 27 to the 2 thirds times a half. So 2 thirds times a half is going to be 1 third. So it's 27 to the power of a third. And then the 3 on the denominator makes a cube root sign. So we need 27 to the power of a third is going to be the cube root of 27, which is 3. So that's going to be 3x over 3. This would all cancel and just leave us with x at the end. With these types of questions, this is the harder indices where we have 32 to the x, 4 to the x plus 2, and 2 to the n. So we have to express everything in base 2. So we need a 2 on the bottom here. So how do we get 2 and 32 with powers? Well, that is 2 to the power of 5. 2 to the power of 5 is the same as 32. We then have 4, which is going to be 2 squared. So we're changing all of the large numbers to powers of 2. 2 squared, and then we've got x plus 2. And then we have a 2 to the power of n at the end. With these powers, we're multiplying them. So 2 to the 5x times 2 to the... 2 lots of x plus 2 is 2x plus 4, because we're timesing these together. And that equals 2 to the n. And then because we've got the same base, we can add these together. So 2 to the 5x plus 2x plus 4 is equal to 2 to the n. And we can tidy that up to 7x plus 4 equals 2 to the n. So now you can see that n here is equal to 7x plus 4. That should be a 4 there, sorry. 7x plus 4. So n in terms of x will be n equals 7x plus 4. Let's try the same with this one. We've got 3 as the smallest number on the base, so we need to change everything to the base 3. So 27 is going to be 3 cubed. 
to the power of x. And then 9 is going to be 3 squared to the y plus 2. Because we're dividing these, we've got 3 to the 3x divided by 3 to the 2y plus 4. Because we've multiplied the, bra uh, the brackets here, the 2 times y plus 2, that's 2y plus 4. And now we have a, the same base, we can subtract these. So 3x take away 2y minus 4, because we're subtracting that whole thing there. So this time n is going to be equal to 3x minus 2y minus 4, like that. The next topic that's worth quite a lot of marks is functions. So we'll have a look at a function here. We've got f of x equals x minus 3. So the f of x is just a way of saying the y value. So if I plot that on a graph, we've got f of x here. We can see that this graph would carry on going up towards infinity and down towards negative infinity. If I had all my values possible for x on the x-axis, I would be getting all of the y values. So we represent this as all of the x values can be any real number. So we kind of write it like this. X is a member of the real set from set notation, so X is a real number. And our F of X will also be any real number as well. So F of X is a member of the real set as well. Okay. Now, when we're talking about the X values or the input values for this function, that is the domain. So this is the X values that we can have. And the range is the Y values that we can have or the F of X values that we can have. So in this case, they're both any number that we could possibly think of. If we try and have a look at g of x, g of x is x squared plus 1. Okay, So I can go all the way to minus infinity on the x-axis and positive infinity on the y-axis. So in this case, our x will be any real number. But when we look at the y-values, it's not possible to have any y-value that's less than 1 because this value is always positive and it's be shifted up by 1. So the g of x, our range of this, is going to be greater than or equal to 1. So this is what we mean by domain and range, and we have to have an understanding of this when we do our graphs. If you did 1 over x and plotted this, okay, then x, we can't have any value that we want because when we have, let's call this h of x, and it is 1 over x, then when we put x equals to 0 on this, then we get some problems because there's no defined value of 1 divided by 0. So x can be any number that we want it to be, any real number, except 0. So we write x does not equal 0. And that is a restriction we have to place on our domain because we can't have 1 divided by 0. Okay. The questions that we usually come up against are, at its basic level, is just putting some numbers into this. So f of 2 just means we replace the x with a 2. So we would have this kind of thing. If we had g of 3, then we would do 3 squared plus 1. If we are doing g f of x, however, that means that we take f of x first, which in this case is x minus 3, and we put that into the function of g. So we, our g function is x squared plus 1, so we have to replace the x with an x minus 3, and that's now squared, and we have the plus 1 that we had left over there. So when we have these composite functions, as they're called, the one closest to the x is the one we do first, so the f is closest to the x. So we do that one first, which is x minus 3, and then we put that into g like this. The question is asking us, for what values of x would g f of x equal 17? So this is g f of x here. We're going to put that equal to 17 and start to solve this equation. Plus 9 plus 1 minus 17 equals 0. So we get x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. And we can start to solve this in the normal way. OK, so when we're doing this g f of x equals something, sometimes that's a letter then we just create the function and then put it equal to this in an equation and start to solve it. Inverse function, if we have a, a function like this, uh, 
and let's say we've got that kind of line there and we want to create the inverse that means we reflect on the line y equals x okay so when we reflect this line on the line y equals x we get our inverse function so if this was f of x then this is our inverse f minus 1 okay so how do we do that algebraically well if we take f of x and we want to find the inverse we let that f of x equals y x minus 3 and then we switch the x and the y's around okay so I've just replaced any x that I see with a y and any y that with an x and I now make y the subject so x plus 3 so that is now our inverse function because we've replaced the x's and the y's if I do the same for g of x then g of x is equal to y which equals x squared plus 1 so I'm going to replace the x with the y and then make y the subject so x minus 1 equals y squared so square root of x minus 1 is equal to y we have plus minus there like that so when we do an inverse we just replace the x and the y and make y the subject the only difficulty that we have with that is if we have a quadratic and we have to complete the square first so if I had to find the inverse of say this one here I wouldn't be able to just replace the x's and the y's I have to complete the square first so make sure that if you have to do an inverse of a quadratic, complete the square first and then you can replace the x's and the y's after that. The next topic is proportion. So if we take a normal x and y graph and we draw a straight line, then these x and y variables are linked together somehow. And in this case, the way that they're linked is by the gradient of this line. So the gradient is telling us what is the relationship between x and y. So if we say that y equals mx plus c, like that, then the relationship between this is really based on the gradient of this line and the y-intercept. But when we're doing proportion, we don't really have this kind of plus c. It's just y and x like this, or y and x squared. If we had y equals x squared like that, then we could have y equals 1x squared or 2x squared or 3x squared. We're not too sure what is the constant in front of the x squared here. And if we do the same with cubic or 1 over x, if we had something like this, y equals something over x. We're not sure if that's a 1 or a 2 or a 3 like that. So we always replace this constant of proportionality, as it's called, with a k. Okay, so m in this case, we would call that a k. So if y is proportional to x, then we replace the proportional sign with y equals k, and then multiply that by x. So we get y equals kx like that. If y is proportional to x squared, then we do y equals kx squared, and if it's a cubed, we do it like that. Or if y is proportional to 1 over x, then we do y equals k times 1 over x, like that and we get y equals k over x so if that's 1 over x squared we do the same thing or if it's x cubed or if it's the square root of x like that we do the exact same thing okay so when we have this proportional to 1 over this is called inversely proportional all right so if you see the word inversely proportional you're going to do 1 over and then once we have this concept understood the rest of the the um, topic is really just substituting in numbers so they might say that y is proportional to the square of x they, did, they write it in that kind of way the square of x so we would do y equals kx squared and then they give you values like y equals 36 when x equals 2 okay so y equals 36 when x equals 2 we're just going to substitute this in and work out what k is equal to once we've done that, it asks us to rewrite this as a formula. So y equals k9x squared. And that's how we finish off that kind of question. And then part b is nearly always, well, what about if x is 3? What would y be equal to? And you just substitute in for that. So once you get over this proportion, how we actually build up the question like this, that second part is actually relatively straightforward. So you just have to realize it's equals k and you're going to multiply it by whatever it says in the question.
Proof is a topic that primarily comes up in paper one because you can't use calculators to do it. And it's really difficult to try and explain um, how these come up and because they, they come up in lots of different ways. Uh, but there are some tips and tricks you can use to do the proof. And really the proof is just kind of, it's like a show that question really for GCSE. The proof is, is it sounds kind of scary because it's like, it sounds all mathematical, but really it's just a case of taking the question and trying to make an algebraic expression or an equation out of it and seeing if you can try and get to where they want you to be. So as an example, if you had to take two square numbers, let's say you have consecutive even numbers, and you have to prove that they're divisible by 4. They divide by 4 when you add them together. How would you prove that? Because you can't just do like, oh, I'm going to do 2 squared plus 4 squared, and then that gives you 20. Oh, yeah, that divides by 4. Let's do 4 squared plus 6 squared. That's 36 plus 16. That's 52. Yeah, that divides by 4. So you can't just do that for every single possible combination. What you have to do is represent this algebraically and show that that will happen by algebra. So if we take an even number, let's say 2n. This is how we always represent even numbers, and 2n plus 1 is always an odd number. So we do 2n squared, and then the next consecutive number would be 2n plus 2, because if we add 2 to that, that will give us our next even number, and we square that. And we're going to expand this to get 4n squared, then this is a double bracket, so 2n plus 2, 2n plus 2. That will give us 4n squared plus 4n plus 4n is 8n plus 4. Add those together, I get 8n squared plus 8n plus 4. How am I going to show that they're divisible by 4? Well, what I can do is I can take that 4 out as a factor. I get 2n squared plus 2n plus 1. So regardless of what n is, it's always going to have a factor of 4 in it because that's the thing that's outside of the bracket. So if, if we had to say prove that they were even, I would have a 2 there and I would pull a 2 out in front of the brackets. If it said prove that something's divisible by 6, we pull 6 out as a bracket. So let's do something like this. Let's prove that an odd number squared is always odd. So 2n plus 1 is an odd number. We represent an odd number with 2n plus 1 and we're going to square it. So when I do my double brackets on this, I get 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. How am I going to prove that that's odd? Well, I need it in the form of two brackets, some number to give it an even, and then I need a remainder of one, essentially, because when I take an even number and plus one, it's always going to be odd. So I'm going to do a two and pull this out as a factor, and then I'm left with plus one. So you can see that any value of n will be doubled to get an even number, because anything multiplied by an even is always even, and I'm going to add one to it to give you an odd number. So if you're looking at proofs and you're wondering how to go about it, most of the proofs are based around this whole odds and evens and divisible by a certain number. So if it says divisible by 7, pull 7 out as a factor, and that's how you prove it. This is an example of a harder probability question, so try and pause the video and see if you can answer this question without any support. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to do that. How would you go about doing this? Because we have red and green counters only, Five are red and the rest are green, so we don't actually know how many there are. So I'm going to represent the total as x. So x is the total. The green will be the total minus 5. Okay, so if we had 20 counters, if red, uh, 5 are red, then 15 would be green. I'm going to draw my probability tree like this to try and get me started. The probability of red in the first instance would be 5, because you have 5 in total, and we have x as the total of all of the counters here, so we would have 5 out of x. If I want to try and go red again, then I would have 1 fewer, so I have 4, and then the total would be reduced by 1, so I'd have x minus 1 there. And if I wanted to go for a green one here, I would have the amount of green is x minus 5 out of x minus 1. To pick a green out from the start would be x minus 5 over x, because that's the number of greens over the total. 
And then if I want to go for a red one here, it would be 5 out of x minus 1, because I haven't picked out any reds yet. And the probability of green would be x minus 5 minus another 1, so that would be x minus 6 out of x minus 1, like that. So we've now filled in this probability tree, and we didn't actually need most of this, but I just wanted to show you how you would do that in case it asks you a different kind of question. It tells us that if you wanted to get two greens, so probability of green and then green, that's going to give you three out of seven. And how do we do that on a normal probability tree? Well, we multiply as we go down the branches. So we have x minus five over x multiplied by x minus six over x minus one, and that gives us 3 out of 7. Okay, So we've created an equation from this which we can now solve because we can multiply x minus 5, x minus 6 in the numerator over x brackets x minus 1, and that equals 3 over 7. So I can cross multiply this to get rid of the fraction. I'm going to times both sides by 7 and times both sides by x brackets x minus 1 to get rid of that one here, and I've started to create my x squared minus 6x minus 5x plus 30 is equal to 3x squared minus 3x. So you can start to now solve this equation because we've created one from this algebraic fractions, and once you solve for x, you'll get two values, and one of them will be one that you can't possibly have. So it might be a negative or you might have a value like 2, but you've already got 5 reds, so you know that x can't be that value. And the examiner is actually trying to see if you understand that when you get your values of x at the end. The next topic is simultaneous equations. So just to recap, when you have two linear equations, they will intersect each other unless they're parallel at one specific point here, which will have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. So when you solve your equation, you get your x and your y. That is actually the coordinates of the intersection points. So sometimes you actually get two marks just for reading this off a graph and giving the x and y solutions. Most of the time, however, we have to solve this algebraically, and there are two methods of doing that. One of them is to multiply the equation so that you get the same term. So you might multiply the second one by 3 to get a 3x here, or you might multiply the second one by 2 to make a 4y and then you can subtract them to try and find one of the terms. The second one is the one that we use in the harder kind of simultaneous equations. is called substitution. So we're going to take this second equation here because we can make this x equals 5 minus 2y, and we can now substitute that x into the first equation here. So we've got 3 lots of x, 3 lots of 5 minus 2y, plus 4y equals 11, 15 minus 6y, plus 4y equals 11. So we're going to have 15 minus 11 is equal to 2y. y is equal to 2. And once we get our y value, we can substitute back in for x equals 5 minus 2y, and that gives us 1. So these two equations will intersect at 1, 2, like that. And I wanted to show you the substitution method because sometimes it's easier than actually tripling this one because students forget to triple all of these or double this one and then you've got to subtract them when you should have added them. So just make sure that when you do this, you can look at see if substitution is a better method. In this case it is. And when you get your 1, 2, just substitute back in to the original equation and see if you give 5 here. So we've got 1 for x and 2 for y. So 1 plus 2 lots of 2 gives you 5 and 3 lots of 1 plus 4 lots of 2 does give you 11, so you know you've got this answer correct. The next concept is circle theorems, which is worth a lot of marks in the GCSE, so let's take a look at some of these. The first thing we're going to do is to split this circle using a chord. So a chord just connects two parts of a circle with a straight line, and what that does is it splits this circle into two parts. We have a small chunk here and a larger chunk here, and the chunks are called segments. Okay, so a segment is a part of a circle that's enclosed by a chord and a circumference like that. So this smaller one here is called the minor segment, and the larger one is called the major segment. 
This is important because a lot of the circle theorems are based around these terms, segments. So, for example, if I was to make an angle here in this segment, and then I make another angle in the same segment, so I create this, you can see that these two angles are in the same segment and they will be equal to each other. These two angles in here are in the same segment as well, the major segment, so they're going to be equal to each other as well. There's another circle theorem that's to do with segments, and that's called the alternate segment theorem. So if you have a tangent here, and then you split this into a chord like that, then you have an angle here which is in the minor segment, and I can create any other angle in the major segment with the corners of these, and they will be the same angle. If I was to create this angle in here, this segment here, then the major segment is this larger one now. So this angle in here that I've created is the same as that one there. So this is the alternate segment theorem because the angle in this is equal to the alternate one. And it's something that Edexcel like to use quite a bit because it's, it's quite abstract. If we have a look at another circle here, and that's the center, then we have an angle at the center is double the angle at the circumference. Students sometimes get confused when we have the center here and we connect it to the side like this. And they, they kind of think it's like this one up here with the alternate segment, so they think this angle and this angle are the same. But it's actually, you can just imagine that this has just been rotated around to here, and therefore this is actually half of this angle at the center. So just be careful when it's connected to the center to have the kind of like the one where it goes all the way across, that's when you have this kind of alternate, uh, same segment one looks like a bow tie there. The final one I want to talk about is a cyclic quadrilateral, and that's when you have a quadrilateral with all of the vertices on the circumference of a circle like that. And if that happens, then the opposite corners add up to 180. So those two corners add up to 180, and these two add up to 180 as well. Last one we have, if you've got a diameter, and you connect it to the point on the circumference, then that makes a right angle like that. When we have recurring decimals, what we do is we write out x equals 0 0.1111 dot 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 like that. And because we have one dot here, we're going to multiply by 10 to the power of 1. So when we multiply by 10 to the power of 1, we get 10 lots of x and we get 1.1111 dot 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 like that. And the purpose of that is so that we can line up these decimal places and subtract them. So if I do the second one minus the first one, I get 10x minus x equals 9x, 1 minus 0, point 0.1 minus 0, 1 minus 0, like that. All of these will cancel out forever, and you're left with 9x equals 1. So x equals 1 over 9, like that. With the two dots here, we've got x is equal to 0 0.121212 dot dot dot. We have two dots here, so we're going to multiply 10 to the power of 2. So we get 100x is equal to 12.1212. And again, these all line up. So when I subtract them, I get 99x equals 12. x equals 12 over 99, which is equal to 4 over 33. With this one, we have x equals 0.123123 dot dot dot. So I have three dots, so I'm going to multiply by a thousand, and that will line everything up. So 123.123123, and I subtract them like this, and that will cancel down further. Okay? With this one, I've, I've got 0 0.1 and then the dot is above the 2. So x equals 0 0.122222 two, 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 like that. And I still just multiply by 10 because I have one dot there. So the 10x is equal to 1.22222 two, 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 like that. So when I subtract them, I just have to be careful because I've got 1 minus 0 and 2 minus 1 like that. So x is equal to 1.1 over 9. And we're not allowed to have decimals and fractions together, so we would make that 11 over 90. Same here, 0 0.123 with the dots above the 2 and the 3. So we have x equals 0 
two, three, two, three, like that. Two dots, multiply by 100, and you get 12.32323, like that. So when I subtract, I get 99x equals 12.2. x will be equal to 122 over 990. If you want to practice these at home, you just have to literally make these up. You can just do any numbers that you want, four, five, dot, like that. And when you get your final fraction, you just have to put that into your calculator and see if it will give you a decimal that looks like this, 0 0.11111. When you press the SD button, it should give you the exact decimal that you're looking for. So these are easy to practice. You can literally just make up 0 0.4. 732 dots like that. Just make up any numbers and this will work for any kind of decimal. The final topic I want to talk about is transforming graphs. So if you have any kind of graph like this and I can just make it, you know, literally any shape that I want, it doesn't matter. I'm going to call that f of x. I can transform this in a number of different ways. I can shift it left and right, up and down, or I can stretch it to the left, or I can stretch it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent those different transformations with different letters in this f of x. So if I put an a in front of this f of x, so I have y equals a f of x, then what I'm doing is I'm taking my f of x values, which is my original y values, and I'm multiplying them by a. So if my original y coordinate, say for example here, is, I don't know, 1,3 like that, my original y coordinate is a 3, so if I have a scale factor of a, let's say a is 2, then my y value is going to be doubled to 6. If my a is a 3, it's going to be tripled to 3. So you can imagine that everything is going to be stretched by a scale factor of a. This point here on the x-axis uh, has a y coordinate of 0. So when you multiply that by any number, that's going to stay at 0. So this is kind of like an anchor point of the graph. And if I have a negative, that's also going to be stretched in the negative direction. So a, an, a factor of a in front of the f of x will stretch it in the y direction. If you have an a which is greater than 1, so a is greater than 1, that's going to be a stretch like that. And if a is between 0 and 1, so if a is between 0 and 1, then it's actually going to be a squash in this direction here. So it's going to be squashed towards the x-axis like that. So if you have scale factor of a third, for example, like a is a third, then the y coordinate will become a third of that and it become one. So it's squashed towards the x axis like that. The next transformation we're going to talk about is a shift up and down by plus or minus b. So if you take your y coordinate and you do your f of x and then you add something to it, like two or three or four, or you subtract two or three or four, that's just going to take your graph and it's just going to shift it up and down by b. So if b is 2, it's going to move up 2 units, and if it's minus 3, it would be shifted down 2 units. So if we have y equals f of x plus b, then what that's going to do is it's going to shift up by b, or if it's a negative, it's going to be moved down by b. Okay. So that 1, 3, if I do 1, 3 plus 2, on the y coordinate, it will just be going up to 5, but the what x coordinate won't change. Notice that when the a and b is outside of the bracket, that's affecting the y. But if it's inside the brackets like this, then it's going to affect the x. So in this case, we have y equals f of cx. And what cx does is it actually squashes the graph towards the y axis. So if c is greater than 1, then it's going to be a squash towards the y-axis like that. So in this case, we have 1, 3. So if I did f of 2x, then that would be a squash towards the y-axis scale factor 2. So that 1 would become a half. And if c is between 0 and 1, then this is actually a stretch away from the y-axis. So if I had f of a half x, then this would be stretched away and I would divide by a half and in that case that would give me 2. So Cx is a stretch in the x direction or a squash depending on what the value of C actually is. And if I have a plus minus D in here, so y equals f of 
x plus minus d. What that does is it moves the graph left or right. So if I have a graph and I want to shift it to the right, then I actually do minus d. And if I want to shift it left, then I do positive d. Okay, so it's kind of back to front to what you think. The c is back to front because you think, oh, 2x, that's going to stretch everything, but it actually squashes it. And if I do x plus d, you think it's going to go to the right, but it's actually to the left. So if I have f of x plus 2, for example, in this case, the plus 1 would be shifted 2 units to the left, and that would become a minus 1, 3. So the whole graph would be shifted to the left. This is usually tested in the exam with trig functions. So if we have f of x equals sine x like that, our usual sine x graph would look something like this between 0 and 360, and it's reflected on the back like that from 0 to minus 360. So if we have f of x plus 2, okay, this graph maxes out at 1 and negative 1 like that then f of x plus 2 would be shifted up because we have our original f of x plus or minus b. So plus 2 would shift everything up, so this whole graph would be moved up two units. So that negative one would be up here, and this positive one would be up there. So the whole graph would be shifted up two units, and it would be up here like this. Okay? The maximum would be 3, and the minimum would be at 1. If I had f of 2x, then everything would be squashed towards the y-axis by a scale factor of 2. So it would be sine of 2x, because I'm replacing the x with the 2x, and my graph would look something like this. I'd have two waves on that side and two waves on that side like that. That's not drawn very well, but you, you get the idea. This would max out at 1, and it hasn't been shifted up or down, it's been squashed to the, towards the y-axis. If I had 2 f of x, for example, which would be 2 sine x, then all of the y-coordinates would be doubled. So I'd have still the same number of waves, but it would now max out at 2 and negative 2 because all of the y-coordinates have been doubled. And if I had f of x plus 30, that would be sine of x plus 30. This would actually be a shift to the left because it's opposite of what you think. So I would have to draw my graph 30 degrees to the left so it would look something like this. Because it's all been shifted to the left. Okay, so I hope that's been useful for you. Make sure you practice all of these topics to ensure your best chances in the exam and I wish you all the best in June.